just ready to collapse. Acknowledge psychological trauma, break through barriers of self-deceit, temperamentic behavior. These are the dark man's terms. The contract. Huh? Found something. Great. Was it alcohol? God no, I just got the wind knocked out of me. I think I know how to break the contract with the dark man. What exactly does that mean? Everything going back to normal. Uh, all right. Uh, I found some more information on Dorsetto and the patients. There are some seriously strange things going on here. I'm pretty sure two of the patients are dead and maybe even the clerk. Oh yeah, I kind of just gave up on worrying about that. Well. Just keep your eyes open, I suppose. What were you doing again? Jeremy made a pact with the Dark Man to keep all the madness locked inside your setup. All right. I'm gonna break it. I just have to... Where is it? Where's the talisman? It's around your neck. Ah! Oh. Ah! Oh. I worry, Detective. Don't. I'm fine. I worry that you're not much help on this case. At least you're a good distraction. Trust me. You're getting your money's worth. At this rate, I'm an absolute bargain. He must first acknowledge psychological trauma in order to proceed. The lying must stop, so we can break through the barriers of self-deceit. Finally, temper manic behavior. Medicine has failed me. Nothing can be done to dispel the hardwood curse. Only the sacrificial dagger may release the despair from Jacob's eye. Yet, doing so would be the doom of Dacetto. Let this curse of mine be a weapon for once. I accept your demands, oh, crawling chaos. Build your prison around this godforsaken hospital. When evil has been starved, I will stay buried forever. Combe never thought he'd be so happy to be back at Dacetto. It felt like he had crawled through a long, dark tunnel of misery and regret. Now that he was back, Combe could look into the steps mentioned in the contract. But there was one thing that gnawed on him. 
What exactly did this have to do with Dr. Gray? be around here somewhere he wouldn't leave this house I don't know what to think anymore you run into that dick fella who is he can he be trusted I think he wanted a good guy well you know not good will he be all right with her coming praise the mother he don't need nobody all that he just, left the the just calm down it ain't time yet God. Hurts. As far as I can tell, Detective Combi seems to be solving problems, not causing them. Just be ready in case he starts anything. The two orderlies still hadn't found Jeremy. Conby figured this was good news. Emily had reminded him about some strange deaths at the Seto, and Combi wasn't sure who he could trust. that We must have faith that Jeremy's pact with the Dark Man is a bluff. If we are lucky, our visitors will find him and prove it's all nonsense before night falls. What is true is our attempt to call on her. Too many things have happened for this evening to be in vain. Think of Jack and Cassandra, even Perosi, whose circumstances I can't understand. Grace is our goat without horns. She knows it and will play the role. You must talk to your brother, Batiste. I worry that he will fail us. Mrs. Thompson. Lunacy in the Astarte Artist Colony. A monograph by Yael Klein. In early 1909, the old Derseto plantation outside of New Orleans was turned into an artist's colony. Three famous European artists rented the house and the surrounding land from the owner, the Ledoux family. The colony was chiefly run by Sebastian Cortez, who was playfully dubbed the captain by his collaborators, William Argus and Heinrich Kassel. The colony existed for six years, until one day all twelve members disappeared without a trace. It is widely believed that their disappearance is connected to the disastrous hurricane that passed through on September 29, 1915, 
but nothing truly supports this claim. What is known is their frequent participation in New Orleans nightlife, their love for hosting parties, and their elaborate contributions to the Mardi Gras parades as the pirates of Ponchartrin. Accounts of their lifestyle can be found in almost every gossip column. It can effectively be summed up as carefree and bohemian. In late June 1909, the name Astarte first appeared in the newspapers. Cortez said the name came to him as he was painting. There is never any claim to knowing about the ancient Phoenician fertility goddess with the same name before this time. His fellow colonist Heinrich Kassel did know, because he later produced sculptures that show clear references to ancient idols of the goddess. It's impossible to know for sure how this name suddenly made an appearance, but it is interesting because of their Seto's history. Even the name Derseto is the Greek name of a Syrian fertility goddess. In the case of naming the plantation, Derseto was certainly not an accident. We know that Elijah Pickford intended to build a temple for his cult, for he had distributed pamphlets two years prior to the purchase of the land, advertising his intentions. His followers were estimated to be almost a hundred men and women, mostly sailors, maroons, and Cajuns, when the plantation was built. To outsiders, Dorsetto registered as an ordinary slave plantation, which enabled Pickford and his flock to remain hidden for decades. The official story is that the cult lasted until 1862, when the Union Army came and burned down the plantation and scattered all who lived there. Following the Civil War, new people started to congregate in the ruins of Dorsetto to invent a new fertility goddess, the Shub Nigrath. As much as Dorsetto is a particular name to have heard of, it's not entirely uncommon among the learned. Astarte is equally known and could have been subconsciously chosen by well-read artists. Shub Nigrath is, on the other hand, very uncommon. Almost impossible that anyone in Louisiana would have heard that name. The name is referenced only in rare books like Unausprechlichen Kulten and the Necronomicon, and is believed to be a bastardization of Arabic words meaning pertaining to the dark young. The few paragraphs printed on the goddess are so upsetting that no one in their right mind would want to build a religion resting on such qualities. The Shub Nigarath cult was hard to get rid of, but it is believed that despite the police jailing and killing several cultists over the years, the main culprit in the cult's demise is the cult itself, which seems to line up with every instance of cult activity on Darseto's grounds. When Captain J.W. Norton of the Union Army arrived, he described the people at their seto as malnourished and maniacal. As much as the army tried to save them, they fought back with fervor, as if nothing was going to stop them from slowly destroying themselves. While the disappearance of the Astarte Artis colony remains a mystery, the recurring motif seems to suggest that their fate involved lunacy and a hunger for self-sacrifice to that fertility goddess with a thousand names. Mrs. Thompson, I understand the last week has been busy. Under these circumstances, I find it important to remind you that Dorsetto's concerns are not a public matter, nor is it something that should upset you. Please continue your excellent work, and don't spend a thought on the death of Perosi, or, more importantly, the suicide of Cassandra Beauregard. They should mean nothing to you or the staff. I rely on your loyalty and trust that your close kinship with the Tabois siblings will keep Dorsetto's secrets hidden. Dr. Gray.
I got a job to do. There must be a spare key to Dr. Gray's office in here somewhere. I don't have the combination for this. But maybe Jeremy did. last guest in the empty room suffered from severe maladaption. I must write this down, because if I understand the condition sufficiently, it could make me deny this fact at a later date, and there is reason for me to think I may come to suffer the consequences from this dysfunction, as some who came in contact with the guest seemed to adopt a new worldview in which everything was predetermined but broken. Upon accepting this worldview, some memories became unmanageable and later rejected. I do not know what this means. I cannot even remember the fate of the guest. I think they were simply misplaced one day and forgotten. Uh, just like all documents pertaining to this guest, they have all been destroyed or they never existed in the first place. Who wrote this? There has never been a guest in the empty room. Dr. Gray was somehow mixed up in this business with the dark man, Detective Conby decided. He had to be. Either Dr. Gray was using the idea of the Dark Man to manipulate and torture Jeremy, or the Dark Man was an actual powerful being possessing Jeremy. And in that case, Dr. Gray was simply a stooge. Maybe both could be true at once. Combe felt his mind racing in all directions. No matter what, he had to find a way to break the pact. That was what Jeremy said was needed. It didn't even matter what was true or not. If Jeremy wouldn't leave De Seto before the contract was broken, then Combi had to make it happen. He just wished the steps on the contract made a little more sense. Dr. Gray's office, all to myself. Let's see if we can figure this guy out. Dearest Dr. Manzetti, I find myself in a losing battle with my patient. As I've disclosed in my previous letter, his delusions have him completely captured. It's bad enough that he is torturing himself with paranoia, but his madness turns out to be quite persuasive to others, effectively laying the ground for mass delusion. 
I am writing to you in hope that you can give me some guidance. Beyond my ambition to avoid devastating surgery on my patient, I have grown worried about my own defenses. The words of my patient are deranged, yet they often resonate with something primitive within me. I have tried photographing his brain with x-rays. It was surprisingly difficult to get good results. Dark blotches on the plates kept obscuring all details. My patient looked at the bad plates and cried out in terror, telling me the dark areas was the shadow of the worm eating him from inside. I could not see anything out of the ordinary. I hope this is a sign that my mind is not as receptive to the madness as I had feared. After further inquiry, my patient described the shadows inside his mind as some kind of chthonic monstrosity that wants to undermine his sanctuary. This is clearly a reference to a place he calls Teroea, a sort of library or convent that works as a psychological haven. With this imaginary haven threatened by this Chthonian, he has now constructed another less pleasant hiding spot. Lately, he has been bringing up a metaphor of a steamboat that has run aground, that he feels like he needs to start the engines and reverse, but he is afraid that the hole in the hull would cause the whole ship to sink. I've been watching him turn this metaphor into reality for the last week. He knows it's made up, but he is doubling down, trying to make it a real memory. I feel certain that this is my chance to break through the barriers of his self-deceit. What a terrible thing to recognize that your betterment was an illusion. That you are so infatuated by the virtue of struggling that despite all your hard work, you made no real efforts to ever become well. Or that the treatment becomes such an obsession that instead of letting your wounds heal over time, you tear at the flesh in the hope that it will heal better and faster. If only it would bleed in the way you wanted. Do we ever become well? What do you think, Dr. Gray? I have finished tidying up Miss Beauregard's belongings. I will leave it to you to contact her agent and have them collect her things. I found one of Grace's drawings she might want back, along with this key in her room, which I believe you've been looking for, Mrs. Thompson. This is where McCarthy has hidden my favorite young. It's very important.
Detective Conby. Good to see you again. Solved your case yet? I'm trying. Hey, Grace, you okay? Oh, she is just peachy, Detective. Are you looking forward to the Feast of St. John, Grace? I can't wait. Kids, ain't they great? What exactly are you planning for tonight? Oh, not much. We eat, we drink, we pay tribute to the wishing tree in the conservatory. The usual. Then why all the excitement? That is just something about tonight. Something's different. I think we all feel it. Besides, we got ourselves some new words for the prayer thanks to your buddy Jeremy. She'll come and turn the world inside out, and things will begin again. That sounds strangely threatening. You should come. Oh, God damn it, Grace, stay put for once. There's something missing. <sighs> Better hold on to these. Wouldn't want them to get lost. McCarthy. McCarthy was a deadbeat. His mere presence annoyed Conby. It was like watching the worst version of himself mock him by simply being worthless. While Conby enjoyed watching the child outplay the drunkard, there was something terrifyingly familiar about Grace. It was taunting him, like he was supposed to remember but couldn't. What did you expect from them? You created too much. There wasn't any room to breathe. Your reification rendered all possible worlds void. You took everything they could imagine and constrained it into something that you didn't even care about. Or maybe you did. Perhaps you cared the most of all. Maybe you tried to save them from themselves. And that is why you had to die. Jeremy knew that the only one who could help him now was the guest in room number three. The room seemed to have been empty for so long. But that wasn't allowed to be true. The story needed to be different. To include something from the outside, he would bring the guest back to room three and show them what was in that safe. Nine, one, three. But those were not the right numbers. That was the combination for the safe in the clerk's office. Detective Combe, I'm terribly sorry that my niece has pulled you into this mess. 
please, with all my blessings, take her away from this cursed place. I have destroyed that eater of worlds and locked it away in the attic and retreated to a place of hiding. Tell Emily I'm safe. Tell her all the lies you can think of to make her listen. Take her back to New Orleans. Sincerely, Jeremy. Brother, I need you to trust me. This is the most important moment in our family's history. I know you have doubts and that the terrible Mama Loa told you lies. I would never betray you. I promise. Lottie. Surprisingly neat. Maybe I've been selling that old barfly short. Looks like McCarthy has something hidden inside. Sometimes I think this place makes me worse. That Dossetto might be my grave. A coffin made of ostentatious architecture. A Taj Mahal for the drunken depressed. There's something about Dersetto. Something about Dr. Gray. Like we all pretend that we're here to get better. When in fact we are here to be forgotten.
take this much more. This has to end. The empty room always felt familiar. It had a mild fragrance of crushed leaves and wet sand that somehow convinced visitors that they belonged. It wasn't real, of course, but it was more real than many other things you could find. This is my... I recognize this view. I belong. I know. I carry it with me. I know that number. Where's that from? I did this. I re
detective. I have made many discoveries in my case. The child we want is safe, thanks to good people like me and you. We are so similar, but you don't see all the things I do. To find your man, Jeremy, you also need to look for the girl. It has always been that way. The young deliver us all. You should have a look in my room. There's a piece of the puzzle you will need. Take care now. My coffee. How long have I been here? It's like McCarthy has something hidden inside. Why would McCarthy lock this up? Was he trying to keep Grace from completing his shame? If so, couldn't you have just made another drawing? What the hell happened in here?
This looks familiar. He was back in the French Quarter. His office, to be exact. A place Jeremy had certainly never seen. It could only mean that the dark man had reached inside Edward's mind and conjured this place for him to suffer. How am I back at the office? Jeremy's never... In here? That's me, isn't it? How long have it been since I drowned my... I think I need to figure out where I'm going first. God, I used to drink so much back then. When was this exactly? What case was I working? I think I need to figure out where I'm going first. I think I need to figure out where I'm going first. Kid got taken by her father, headed out of state, but he had made a mistake by selling a painting that his wife actually cared about to a collector named Thornhill to fund his venture. That's how I tracked him down. At least I think so.
I can't go that way. Principles keeping him from handing out information about his deals. So it needed some convincer. Well, every case can't be squeaky clean. Mr. Saunders had sold a valuable painting to Thornhill, hoping the money would carry him to wherever he was going. The painting, now leaning on the easel in Thornhill's bedroom, had a certain mesmerizing gloom that seemed to call out to me, telling me I was needed for something important. I felt myself falling into the painting, only being brought back by Thornhill, thrusting an address to a Hotel St. George into my hand and asking me to get the hell out. I don't remember this at all. The kidnapper had sold a painting to Thornhill, the collector, to pay for a car and enough gas to get out of Louisiana. Detective Comby was suddenly reminded of shaking him down to find out where the kidnapper was hiding. St. George's Hotel by the park. Comby vaguely remembered the case of the missing child. She was kidnapped by her estranged father. There was some connection to a gallerist named Thornhill, a painting sold to pay for a getaway. But I can't say it didn't happen. 